Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to start reading in ver from verses 1 through 16. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and of a son, than an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when you knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. There is then the blessedness you spoke of. For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And I didn't really put this last portion of the passage in my actual notes that I was going to preach this morning. But it's, it's kind of like Paul goes from teaching theology back into some narrative. And he reminds them of when he had been with them before. He talks to them about the fact that, that they really hadn't injured him through... <coughs> through what, what, you know, the way that they were responding. But he says here, but I want you to be, I, I want you be as I am, for I am as you are. And what he's talking about right there is the fact that he himself brought himself out from under the law and, and began to walk in the freedom and liberty that Jesus Christ had purchased for him. And so therefore he's encouraging these Gentile Christians to do the same. Whenever we first started the introduction to Galatians, we talked about the fact that these that the church or the region of the churches over there were Gentiles in nature. They showed that they were in an area called Asia Minor where there were a lot of false gods, pagan gods, and they weren't really Jewish by nature. So therefore, they didn't know the God of the Jews and they 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 had worshiped false gods, but that there were false teachers that had come in and were teaching them to return or to add to their Jesus these traditions of the law and these uh, going back really to the law and rules and regulations. You know, just some of the things that he had talked about also. He said, are you going to go back into bondage now that you've been set free? He talks about observing days and months. And, you know, there's that big movement. There's a movement in the church. And I know we talk about it some, but it's called the Jewish Roots Movements. And one of the things I've seen preachers that they're actually Jewish, Jewish by culture and they've gotten saved. And, and But yet at the same time, they're pushing an agenda forward and a lot of people are buying into it that in order now to really be pleasing to God, you have to keep the Jewish calendar. You have to go through the whole Passover process. They even talk about, you know, where, and I don't mean to be so repetitive. I know I spoke about this not that long ago, but I just want to try to get, get your mind wrapped around it to understand that these kinds of things are going on outside of the church and it doesn't, or in the church, and it doesn't always have to be the same thing, but it's when you're adding something to the simplistic faith in Christ Jesus that you're saying, I have to do this in addition to my faith in order to be right with God, that you now allow yourself to come out from under the grace that Jesus purchased and you now bring yourself under a system of law. And Paul had previously spoken to the Galatians and explained that whenever you do that, you frustrate the grace of God. <laughs> you know, people many times think, oh, uh, you know, whenever somebody 
sins or gets caught in sin or whatever the case that they talk about the fact, oh, that person fell from grace. No, the truth is, is that when a person fails God or falls into sin, that's the perfect time to fall into grace, Amen. not fall out of grace. Amen. And that's what grace is for. The grace of the Lord sets us free. Amen. The grace Amen. of the Lord through true repentance forgives us of our sin. When we fall out of grace is when we're trying to approach God through a different method, when we're trying to approach God through our own works and performance. And so many times we don't even recognize it that way. But false religion is always built on on a works based performance based program. Anytime you want to look for a cult, anytime you want to look for false religion, all you have to do is see what the emphasis of the message surrounds. Listen to me. And, and I'm just telling you right now, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and list them all off, but, but they're there. And uh, so I wanted you to, you know, I wanted to just bring that up to you. But uh, you talked about them observing these days and months. You said, you're not, you didn't injure me. I want you to be like I am. I came out from under law. But then he says, when I first came and preached the gospel to you, and he talked about the fact that he, he said that, uh, that they, they didn't reject him and that he came to them and he preached the gospel to them in infirmity. I just think this is an interesting note. If you don't really read the background context, you may not get it. But in that last paragraph, when he says, you know how through infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first and my temptation, which was in my flesh. So that language there sometimes can be a little bit difficult to understand. But, he's but that word temptation really could be translated trial. The trial that was in my flesh. He's saying, when I came to you the first time and preached to you, I was infirmed. Physically in my body, I had an illness. Then he goes on later to talk about the fact that you would have plucked your eyes out for me. And so many scholars, we don't really know exactly what it was that was going on with the Apostle Paul, at least the first time that he went to Galatia. But many scholars believe that there was some type of an eye condition that was going on that really would have probably made him come across as a little bit unsightly. There were a lot of different eye conditions that took place during this time frame that's well documented in secular literature. Some of it had to do with these eye mite things. And I'm not trying to speculate what it was, but it seems like there was something regarding the Apostle Paul's appearance that made him unsightly. But nevertheless, the message that he preached when he publicly portrayed Jesus Christ as crucified before them was embraced by the people. I think that there's a big, there's actually something to, to speak about in that, that like a lot of times, you know, we're, we're drawn to all the pretty folk or we're drawn to what looks good or we're, we're drawn to, to what makes us feel good or what we determine or in our minds is, is the right thing. But, you know, whenever, whenever the, the Lord really moves upon our heart and he begins to, to deal with us at the, at the level, if we will allow him to. A lot, a lot of that stuff starts getting corrected in our hearts and in our lives. That's what the message of the cross will do. It'll get down, get down to the pin, to the pinpoint of what's wrong with our hearts, right? The areas where we're arrogant, the areas where we're prideful, the areas where we think of ourselves. These are the secrets of our heart that nobody else really knows about. We know about them because we carry them around with us. Right. But uh, but God, God's wanting everybody to be able to be ministered to. Amen. And he's not wanting us to pick and choose. I mean, even the Lord himself talked about that. This wasn't a big part of my message. But since we're here, let's talk about it. The Lord himself said it. he says, you know, many of you want to sit in Moses' seat. Like, in other words, in the temple, their area, there was a seat. It seemed like it was elevated. And, and, and it was called Moses' seat. And so people that wanted respect, sometimes they'd find themselves sitting in that seat. They wanted to elevate themselves. They talk about if somebody comes into your congregation and one person has, the Lord said that, and one person's got tattered and torn clothes. And then another guy comes in with this pretty ring and these nice garments on. You, you want to receive the one with the pretty garments and the pretty ring. But, but, but what about the other guy? That's, not only are his clothes tattered and torn, but his life could be tattered and torn. Amen. And so uh, I think that this is what, you know, I got, I just got that out of this particular passage that in all of that, the apostle Paul, even though there was something going on with him, the people heard the message. Amen. And they responded in it and it humbled their heart. The first point that I wanted to make about uh, out of this passage of scripture that we just read, point number one had to do with son versus servant. And if we'll look back at verses one and two, 
This is what the Apostle Paul... Now, you got to remember, too, the context. I don't know. As I was reading through this passage of Scripture again and again and just trying to, like, prepare in my heart to see what overall the Apostle Paul was saying, one of the things that's interesting to me... Uh, one guy called me up the other day to talk, and he said, Man, I watched your, started watching your series on Galatians. He said, I think since I started watching it, I've read the book of Galatians 20 times. Now, he's hungry. I'm going to be honest with you. When I talk to him on the phone, he gets he whets my appetite for the Word of God. But, I mean, that's hunger. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, the preaching, the, the teaching ain't really that good, but he's just hungry for the Word, and he's hungry for the book of Galatians right then. And uh, But as I began to read it, it, it started sticking out to me more. Just the way that 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 the whole book is put together. And what I'm saying is, is that we've already covered what the main context is. And it's law versus grace. And it's the danger of people coming back under law or legalism or what, or what scholars call Galatianism. But as you go through the book, you see that Paul uses various analogies to go back and illustrate the main concept and concern that he has. And so in this six chapter book or whatever the case, he repetitively goes back and he just re-illustrates. Time and again. Now, what that tells me is, is that if the Lord, because sometimes, especially in this church, it's like, golly, dude, you're going to preach again <laughs> on works versus grace. Well, as many times as God keeps bringing the subject back to us, it's obviously very important. Amen. And there's a possibility that even some of us who feel as though we got something figured out might find ourselves slipping back into a works based yeah. or thinking more highly of ourselves than what we ought or whatever the danger yeah. is that God's trying to warn his people yeah. about that we have to make sure that we're ready. Amen. And that we're seeing yeah. things the right yeah. way. So so once again. You got to remember that the underlying context regarding what we're talking about this morning has a lot to do with the law. OK, so look at verses one and two. It says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father. You know, I didn't get really go back to it, but I was thinking about the illustration and illustration of this concept would be like the prodigal son. You remember the story of the prodigal son whenever he and his brother uh, were together living under the house of their father and the prodigal, he's like, I want my stuff now. I want to get my inheritance now because I got some living that I want to do, right? And the Bible teaches us that, that the father went ahead and he distributed the inheritances and the young man took off and he went to go for lack of better words, what we'd say in English, modern English vernacular, he went to go sow his oats. He went to go do the Amish thing, whatever it is that they do, if you ever saw any of that kind of show. But so, so he started living crazy. He spent his money on prostitutes. He spent his money. And the next thing you know, he didn't have anything left to do. I mean, he, he had just drained everything and he was left in shambles. And it had gotten so bad that he had actually allowed himself to come under the employment, really a form of slavery, if you will, to somebody that was raising pigs, hogs. And, and, and he went to go feed the hogs on that particular day. And I mean, I just tried to imagine it in my mind, but them hogs are snorting and sniffing and got mud all over them. And, and he's over there and he dumps the food in the pig pen and he's actually sitting there. I don't know if he's falling down now on his, I mean, he's in a state of misery. I don't know if he's falling down in the slop with the hogs at this point. And he just can't believe where it is that he's ended up. He doesn't understand how it is that he got there. And he thinks in his heart about eating some of that pig slop. I mean, that, he's hungry and that's how bad off he is. And, he, and he, he, he's actually not just thinking about it. He's like craving it. And at that moment in time, it's like a moment of clarity comes to his mind. And he says, the servants in my father's house are better off than what I am. He said, I'd be better off getting up and heading back to my daddy's house and I'm going to submit myself as a servant to my father. Now, the good news is, is the beauty is that this is a type of God with us. The truth be told is that each and every one of us at some point in time, even many times, even after we've come to the Lord, maybe not quite as bad as this old boy, but you get the point, uh, have ventured off and have found ourselves separated from the presence of God, feeling unworthy to come back to God. And then whenever we finally came to the place where we truly surrendered, we realized that God was waiting the whole time. And that in reality, it wasn't, he, no, you're not going to be a servant. Why? 
You can't be a servant. I'm your father. You're my son. I've been longing for you to come back, right? And because my nature is in you. My DNA is in you, son. You're my son. And it's the same thing for the spiritual child of God. When you've been, you were born of Adam, yes, you had some unsavory DNA that you received from him. But when you gave your heart to Christ, amen, you now became a partaker of the divine nature. That's what the word of God teaches. What does that mean? It means the Holy Ghost came to live in your heart. And you're not the same. Now you're a son of God. To those that would believe in him, he gave them the power to be sons of God. Amen. Amen. And so, listen, you're not a servant, but that's what the Apostle Paul's talking about right here. Sons versus servants. He, he's talking about the fact that, that the, the son of a master who is wealthy is no different than the servant of the master when he's a young child. When he hasn't reached a level of maturity yet, he's under tutors and governors. Those are other words to talk about servants. You remember last week we used the word schoolmaster. We talked about the fact that that was a type of a servant that was in charge of the conduct and the overall well-being of the child and would wake him up and send him to school, make sure he was eating right and studying right and doing all those things. These are other types of servants. And so essentially the law, that's what the Apostle Paul's talking about again, the law was serving in, in, as Christianity or I'm sorry, as God's plan of salvation was in an infancy or a childlike immature stage, the law served as a tutor or a governor to rear up that child because he wasn't mature enough to enjoy the inheritance that, that the father had for him because he was just going to squander it like the prodigal did. And so the servant has no inheritance and the child can't enjoy the inheritance. So until he reaches adulthood, he's under these these uh, tutors and these governors. But one of the things that we need to know and understand and remind ourselves is that there's a time when he does grow up. And when he grows up, he can be trusted with the inheritance. He comes to a place of maturity. And, and you know, there's many times in our own lives that we want the Lord to hurry up and move. And that was one main thing that kind of showed up in my heart when I was looking at this. You want, we want the Lord to hurry up and move, but it, the, the word terminology appointed time was there. And God has an appointed time. Amen. Amen. And, and, and there is a, a point of time and, and there's still the validity to boundaries of the law. They mark our territory. I wanted to bring that up too. that sometimes when we look at the law, we, we only look at it in a negative sense. And God's law did provide some things. Now, listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you. I'm just trying to bring balance to the message is all I'm trying to do. God's law gave certain boundaries. And tells you a red flag. It's got certain territories. But God's plan is not for us to live according to the law. Right? He wants us to live according to grace. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit really wants to be your compass. Yeah. He, he doesn't want you to have to live according to like, you know, these flagged off sections like police area. Do not cross line. Yeah. However, that police area is there. And it's there for a purpose to remind you that there's certain places that you shouldn't go, right? <laughs> there are many times, and so we can have freedom, but even in our freedom, there must be caution. So that's really what we're talking about here. The servant, he doesn't really have a lot of freedom. He's under law. He's still immature as a child. The Apostle Paul is saying it's time to grow up and to begin to understand how to properly walk with the Lord, right? But, but when you're a child, you have to be told where to go. You have to be told where to go, where not to go, what not to transgress. Well, guess what? In our, in our maturity as a Christian, many times when we first get into the Lord, I'm not trying to say that it's all that bad. What I'm trying to get at is, is this. You know, the Apostle Paul said, he said that all things are lawful, but not the, all things are expedient. Amen. What that means is, is that it's nobody else's job to tell you necessarily what type of movie you ought to go see. The Holy Spirit wants to tell you what kind of movie you ought to go see. But what I will tell you is this. There was a time when I first got saved and basically the preacher that I sat under, she said, you ought not see nothing more than PG-13. The problem that you run into is, is this, is that when you make a law for yourself and you say, I will not see PG-13, mm -hmm. next thing you know, you're looking at mature. Right. But what I will tell you is this. A lot of what she said was true. <laughs> 
There's a whole lot of PG-13 movies we probably ought not be watching. Yep. And if we're not careful in our freedom and in our liberty, we cross boundaries that begin to sear our conscience. Yes. A lot of times the issue, and I think I have this in my notes somewhere, but this seems like the right time to say it. A lot of times the issue is, is that I just want to know what I want to know what I need to know and I want to know where I'm supposed to go. Yes. Come on, preacher. Just tell me where to go. Tell me what I need to know. Wrap this thing up and let me get back to the house. It, don't, it doesn't work that way. That's not how true Christianity works. True Christianity works by us understanding faith and grace and walking. Amen. Uh, in the will of God. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 8 because I'm talking about freedom now. I'm talking about law. This was a good analogy, uh, I thought, to look at this real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. All right. This may not seem like it makes a whole lot of sense to you, but I hope that I can bring it back around. This is a passage of scripture that a lot of times. Preachers don't really mess with too much, but it's interesting to me, so we'll use it as an illustration. Now it's touching, and we're talking about the law now, and we're talking about freedom. Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. So he's talking to people. There's obviously something that's happened in the church of Corinth that has caused them to talk about this. And the people that seem to have more knowledge about the gospel feel like they have a right to be a little bit more free in their walk. Okay. And so the apostle Paul's acknowledging that. But, but this is what he says. We all know that we have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up. But charity edifies. So what he's trying to say is you might have a whole lot of knowledge, but if you're not careful, your knowledge is going to make you prideful. And if your knowledge isn't mixed with love from the Lord, you're, 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 not, you're not going to be edifying or building up the body of Christ and helping the people around you. He says, if any man thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man loves God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. That would have been the argument of these knowledgeable Christians. They would have said, false gods aren't even real. What's, what's, the, what's the issue here? I got the freedom to eat whatever it is that I want to eat. And we'll get into that a little bit more to explain it. He says, as uh, concerning those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be many gods and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat makes your brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. And so... There's a lot of background context here, but the idea is, is that during these ancient times, oh, Gaudi came over here yesterday and he was where we're working on trying to translate some Spanish stuff. And I don't remember what made him say it, but he made the comment that meat, oh, he was talking about the pastor over there that's on the ground and like just how many pesos it cost him just to cross the river to go over there. To, he's starting another mission. This guy Ramon is, man, I'm telling you, he's like, he's like full throttle. Uh, the ministry's blowing up over there, okay? But it costs money, right? And so anyway, but he, he talked about the fact that meat is very expensive over there. And, and, and I said, I guess that's why there's a whole lot of arroz and frijoles, beans and rice, because not everybody can afford meat. And that's kind of what the context is here. A lot of these lower level Christians in the past had never 
were not able to eat meat on a regular basis. And they would have these pagan festivals where they would dish out meat. And during these festivals, everybody was able to eat meat. But they would offer up meat to the idols, and it was a form of worship. They still kind of do that stuff today in the occult. The pagans, I've talked to some people in the conversation, and they'll lay hands on that goat. And then they roast it, and they eat it, and they think that they're taking demons into themselves. And that kind of like the same thing that was going on then. But what the knowledgeable Christians were saying, or the more probably aristocratic or richer Christians were saying is, listen, false gods are false gods. They're not even real. So we can eat meat and we don't have to stress about all of that. And the Apostle Paul was saying there is a certain level to what you're saying that's true. False gods are false gods. But he goes on to explain elsewhere that you can't, if you knowingly know that the meat was offered up to worship the devil, you can't eat at the table of demons. But if you don't know whether or not the meat was, don't stress about it because you're not serving False gods. And so I guess that you and I can extrapolate some of that stuff into our own lives. That crosses over into our own lives. Because when we begin to walk in the freedom and liberty. See, we're talking about going from a servant to a son. And the liberty that Christ brings. And the fact that the Holy Spirit begins to minister to our hearts. And shows us things that are right versus things that are wrong. We need less boundaries. We need less rules to govern us. And now the Holy Spirit desires to govern us. But the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes there's people around us that when they see what we're doing, when they see our behavior, it can cause them to stumble. It can because they see you doing it. They see me doing it and they think in their mind that it's perfectly fine. But they, they think in their mind that it's not fine because the Lord's dealt with them about that thing. Like, for instance, well, I don't want to use that as I don't know what I want to use. You, you, there's been some things in my life that that I felt perfectly fine. With. I'm just telling you, like I didn't feel like I was justifying it. Maybe I was, uh, and I didn't feel like there was an issue with it, and so I did it. Well, I kept hearing feedback from multiple sources, and it was always joking in a way, but at the same time, it was obvious that it was bothering people. Whatever it was that I was doing. Well, I'm, yeah, for me, it was, I was jogging with my shirt off. I'm just telling you, I personally didn't have a problem with it. You might still have a problem with it. I didn't have a problem with it. And, and whatever, first of all, I didn't think that it was really going to cause anybody any issues. But nevertheless, I was, I was running with my shirt off and I heard feedback, but not just from one person. I heard it from multiple people. And so at some point in time, and I think I finally got it solidified in my head now that I'm not going to run with my shirt off anymore. I mean, every time I get it solidified in my head, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do it because, like, I want to get some sun. And then every time it happens, I get feedback. So guess what? It's not worth it. By the grace of God, I will not run. As long as the earth stands, like the Apostle Paul said, I will not run with my shirt off anymore in public. All right? And so that's just one little silly type thing, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. It is a little bit silly, but it's a, but it is but at the same time it's significant that that if it's causing other people to to, to question it or whatever the case, dude, what's the big deal? Why you know why do you have? And that's just one little aspect, but there can be much more serious things out there. That we feel like we have the freedom because we have knowledge that this really, that I should have the freedom to do this. Uh, but you know what? All things may be lawful, but they're not all expendable. Uh, expedient is what the Apostle Paul said. All right. And so that's basically what was going on. And so in these situations, if somebody saw them eating meat and was like, man, I thought it was bad to eat meat. That was that was, you know, connected meats connected to these false idols and these people are eating it. And then they go, you know what I'm saying? Then they begin to enter into that particular type of behavior. But the Lord was actually calling them away from that because maybe they used to deal with that. Maybe they used to eat meat. That truly was offered to idols and they used to be worshiping false gods, right, through that action. And now whenever they engage in that, I, I tell you another one. There was a time in my life whenever I had convinced myself that drinking alcohol was OK. And I'll, and I'll be perfectly honest with you that I don't think that drinking alcohol is OK. I don't think that even a little bit's OK. I think that we can really break it down and, 
and discuss it in a lot, you know, uh, in detail, but I don't really want to do that. I'm just telling you from my personal life, when I first got saved, the Holy Spirit, you remember how I told you, there's boundaries and police tape that says don't cross this line. And that's how most people preached alcohol in the churches that I went to, yeah. right? But when I first got saved, I didn't even need a boundary because the Holy Ghost immediately spoke to my heart and said, for you, my boy, sin, drinking is a sin. Now, I said that before and somebody questioned me afterwards. Well, so it's not a sin for everybody? Well, was it a sin? I didn't mean to get into all this. I stepped into it, but I, I'm going to just do it. Was it a sin when the Apostle Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his belly? Yeah. See what I'm saying? You can't just sit here if you want to really exegete the scriptures. Now, the point being is this, is that the wine that Paul was telling Timothy to take was much different than the wine. It, they would cut it three parts to one. And not only that, many times it wasn't as fermented at the time. I can tell you this right now. The Apostle Paul was not telling Timothy to get drunk because right. drunkenness is a sin. That's but what I will tell you is this, is that the Holy Spirit told me that drinking for me was a sin. And I knew what he was talking about. But then I would see a scripture where Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his belly. And I'm thinking, well, things are a little different for me now. I might be able to take a little wine for my belly. And the next thing you know, it ain't just a little wine for my belly. It's a lot of wine for my head. And the things aren't right. And when I get a lot of wine in me, or not even really a lot, just a little bit, I don't act like a Christian. That was what the Lord was trying to reveal to me from the get-go when the Holy Spirit began to talk to me. Because when I drink wine, my inhibitions go way down. And not only do I start looking and thinking about stuff I'll not look and think about, I start being willing to try stuff or to go back to stuff that I had gotten away from. And so many times it's just a simple door that the enemy uses to open up. So not only that, but you add to it the fact that somebody sees you doing that. That's right. The whole thing, you know. I don't think that just because I'm running without a shirt on that a whole bunch of women in the church are going to want to start running around with their shirt off. But <laughs> somebody sees you drinking and they're thinking, oh, I guess I can do that. That happened to me. Yeah. That, that happened to me. And I've probably shared that story before when I used to go to the other church and, and I was in my little liberty stage. I get a little wine from my belly. And I had, it, it, I don't know, I'd tell this story, but I don't know what in the world. Why did I think I need a glass of red wine at Tampico's? Is that the most ridiculous thing you ever heard of? But anyway, that's what I was doing. Because I had justified in my mind, margarita wasn't right, but a glass of wine was okay. And so I had my wine in the, in the middle of the table and the pastor's son walked in. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think that those preachers watch these videos, but if they do, I, st I apologize to you today for that because that was a failure on my part as a Christian. Because I don't think that that boy's ever really been the same. It ain't all my fault, but it affected him. Yeah. And he walked in, and I can remember I tried to hide the wine behind the little thing that was on the table. <laughs> and he, and that was one of the first things. He was good friends with my nephew, Nick. And he said, I didn't know you drank, drank alcohol. And, you know, his, his mom was very uh, gracious whenever. But she brought correction in my life, you know. She used that scripture about the weaker brother and, and all of that kind of thing there. I didn't mean to spend this much time on that, but I'm just trying to explain the difference between the, the police tape that says do not cross this boundary versus the Holy Spirit if we're listening to him, speaking to our heart and telling us not to go to a certain place because he knows the damage that those things can cause to us, right? That's right. All right. The next verse I wanted to look at is verse 3 out of that Galatians passage. We're still talking about the difference between a servant and a son. He says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, the word elements there really means the first order of things. So the idea is, is the first teachings, the elementary principles. It uses that word also in the book of Hebrews where it says not go, moving backwards to the elementary, elementary teachings of Christ. People, people have used that actually, that, that passage out of Hebrews to come against, uh, to, to come against the message of the cross. Where, where it says, I believe it's in Hebrews 6, but it talks about forsaking the elementary principles of Christ. And what they say is, see, that's talking when it talks about baptisms and it talks about and it starts to list some various things out of Hebrews. I, I, I'm not going there, but I'm just using this as an example. And people think, you see, 
that's what it's talking about. Because it talks about sacrifices and the shedding of blood. And so the people that come against the message of the cross, because they're ignorant of what that text is really saying, they use that to come against the message of the cross. And they say, see, we're supposed to leave, move on from the cross. And they'll say like, you know, things having to do with the Holy Spirit or whatever the case, whatever their reasoning is, which is ridiculous because the Holy Spirit works through the cross. But the whole elementary teachings is actually talking about the first teachings of the Christ, which were actually Old Testament principles. Old Testament principles that had to do with washings and the baptismal washings of the Old Testament had to do with the Old Testament sacrifices. Those things we're leaving those behind. Not that we're forgetting them, but we realize now how they were fulfilled. And now we're moving forward into understanding that Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things. And so the way that this word element is being used again here is that it's talking about the first Teachings are the first order of things. It describes the law and how spirituality functioned under the law and that it resulted in, limita in limitations instead of liberty. The people of God were held in check by the law just as the child heir is held in check by the tutors and the governors. And many times people like, this is where I was said it earlier, people want to be told exactly what's right versus what's wrong. You ever, you ever been there before? Yeah. They want formula Christianity. Yeah, right. Tell me A plus B equals C. <clears throat> one plus one equals two. I want to know what I can do and what I can't do, right? But once again, that's not really how it's supposed to work. Because if that's the case, then like I said, we just show up. We want to be told what to do. They want to pay the preacher to tell them what to do. And then they just want to go home and move on with their own life. And, but, but in reality, when you do that, there's no push to move forward. There's no push to move, to move forward with knowing God. There's no push, no responsibility to learn the word for ourselves. And we have, each have a responsibility to learn the word of God for ourselves. It's not like you just pay the preacher and the preacher, you know, does all the groundwork and, and, and teaches people. No, we're all the word of God says that a workman that need not be ashamed that rightly divides the word of truth for themselves. Amen. So it's each and every one of our own responsibilities as Christians to learn the word of God. It's the preacher's responsibility to make sure that he's, you know, breaking down the word of God, teaching the word of God in such a way to augment the work of the, of the Christian soldier as he uh, learns of the Lord for himself. One, of the, one thing, though, about the difference between a servant and a son is that a servant obeys his master out of fear. If I don't do what my master is telling me to do, then there's going to be repercussions that are going to negatively affect my life, right? But a son of a good father obeys his father out of love. And I put the word good father in there because a lot of times we didn't really have good fathers. You know, I'm just being honest. I mean, whatever the case, our upbringing and how our parents treated us can skew our understanding of the Lord. We begin to see God through the eyes of the way our parents treated us. And we begin, I don't know about you, but we will reject authority. I mean, I had a major problem with authority as a, as a young man growing up. I can remember being a Christian and really loving God and just sitting like in the parking lot. I don't remember what it was about. I was probably about 19, 20, giving my heart to the Lord. God had really done a work in my life, but I still had this, I hate to admit it, this pig mentality. I'm, if there's any policemen in the crowd, I don't know if you have any policemen. But that's what I used to think about policemen because that's what I had been trained up to think in my mind regarding authority in my life. And I was constantly breaking the law. And so I looked at them at the end as the enemy. And even now that I've given my heart to the Lord, I'm sitting in a car and this policeman knocks on the window and I can remember I rolled it down about that much. <laughs> so, and he's wanting to tell, and, and I just wasn't scared of the police, even still at this point in time. Now I have a healthy reverence for the police because to be honest with you, I got a lot to lose now if I don't have to act like a fool. But at that time, I didn't have nothing to lose. And I had been arrested multiple times and beat up by policemen before and so none of that really bothered me. I'm like, what's up, dude? What you got? You know? Well, the, the problem, that's why I don't really know why I went off on that other than to say we can have a problem with authority in general. Yeah. And, and sometimes the way that our parents treated us, our father treated us, but that's not how the father is. Mm -hmm. that, that's not how God is. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. He's not trying to beat us up and, and be that. But many times people even preach that way. When you have a law preacher and listen to me, I'm not talking about he's preaching the Mosaic law. I'm talking about he's preaching rules and regulations. You're going to wear your clothes and they're going to look like this. You're going to wear your hair. It's going to look like this. Women aren't going to do this. Men are going to do this. And you're going to live like this. And I'm thinking to myself, hold on a second, Hoss. The Holy Spirit, you're, you're going to have a hard time proving any of what you're talking about from the scriptures to number one. But number two, it's the Holy Spirit that's supposed to be speaking to the heart of the people. And true Christianity is supposed to be a situation where the man from the pulpit doesn't dictate holiness to the, into the pew. But the Holy Spirit in our hearts begins. To re begins to show us what it is that God wants from us. Amen. Each and every one of our lives. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen? So a servant obeys his master out of fear, but a son of a good father obeys his father out of love. When you have a good father and you know that he's trying to lead and guide you in the right direction, he, you may not realize it all the time, but time and again, he proves himself Amen. that he's not trying to hurt you. But then in reality, he just desires to help you, you know, and that is one of the undoubtedly one of the most beautiful things about the message of the cross, at least to me, that when we begin to experience the liberty and freedom that comes from God's truth, we begin to experience and understand God's love at a whole nother level. I can't even really describe. I don't know how to really describe this. Other than to to kind of like tell you from experience what it feels like. And those of you that have experienced it. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but if you've ever lived in bondage, even as a Christian, and then you began to understand the message of the cross and the grace that flows from that, and how, how easy the victory comes from the work of the Holy Spirit whenever that revelation comes and, and it begins to work in your life, it, it's the most amazing thing. Whenever the power of sin in your life is broken through the power of the Holy Spirit, yes. and it's almost like fruit that just is so ripe that it fall, effortlessly is just it, the harvest. It's, it's effortless. Because you're no longer having, but at the same time, you remember how hard you were trying to work before to get it done. And then all of a sudden, when you transitioned your faith to Christ and, and the revelation came, it's like the victory was so simple, the victory was so secure, it was so obvious it was God, that you're really overwhelmed by the grace of the Lord, you're overwhelmed by the love of God, amen, and it begins to work in your heart and your life like, dude, I am one happy son right now, because my father is so good to me, and then it becomes that there's a desire out of the abundance of the heart to serve the Lord. You know, a couple of one of my favorite scriptures, I've used it a lot, is first John chapter three, verses one and two. It's been a couple months since I used it, so I feel okay. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear. What we shall be, but we know that when we sh when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, the first son of God, hallelujah, had to be fulfilled in order for us to become the sons of God through him. But this word, man, what manner of love, and I know I've talked about this multiple times. It describes a love that's from a different tribe. In other words, if you looked at it in the original language, that's one of the words that we'll use, a, a tribe that's from a uh, love that's from another tribe. So the idea is that the, the love is foreign to the person that's being told about. It's a distant type. It's a foreign type of love. In other words, it comes from somewhere else. The love of the father comes from somewhere else. It's a love that's not inherent in man. It's the agape love of God that has to be infused into man from the outside. It has to come. It, it's given to man as a gift through, through the Lord when the Lord comes to live in our hearts. But it's foreign to our understanding. It's a completely selfless type of love. Sacrificial type of love. It doesn't mean that if you sacrifice for someone that you're automatically operating in that type of love. There's a lot of times that people sacrifice for people self, and they feel real good about themselves when they do that. But the reality of it is, is that in their, in their heart, or even if they know it or not, their, their motive is, is that they want something in return. 
That, that's not the love of God. He just he, he, he wants our he wants us to respond to his plan. Amen. But but God sent his son Jesus to die so that we could be sons of God, whether we respond positively or negatively. It, it, that's neither here nor there. Jesus has already done it for the entirety of the human race. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says this. And hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. We're talking about the difference between a son and a servant. A servant out of fear obeys his father. A son out of love obeys his father. You know, this hope right here is talking to coming on the heels when we first were talking about Romans a while back, where it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have access into this grace in which we stand. He says we glory in the hope of God. But not only that, we glory in tribulation because tribulation produces patience. Amen. And, uh, and which it means endurance and, and, and endurance produces character in the life of the believer and character produces hope. And so and, and hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And so even though we go through things in the midst of our life that are negative and even though there's painful circumstances and situations that are happening in trial and tribulation in the midst of it all, God wants to reveal the way his plan works to us. He justified us. What does that mean? He declared us as innocent because we put faith in Christ, which gave, which gave us access to grace. And grace flowing in our lives is strengthening us, even in the midst of the trials that are going on in our lives. And whenever we make it through the trial, through the grace of the Lord, it gives us hope that God is who he says he is, that God can do what he says he can do, and that his word is true. Amen. And then it increases our our love for the Lord. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, we in turn desire to love our Father. Amen? There becomes a desire to love the Lord more and more, a desire to know His Word more and more, a desire to serve Him more and more. But as long as the Christian is being suffocated by rules and law, constantly facing the failure of his own performance, because listen to me, each and every one of us know that every time that we try to make rules and regulations for ourselves and try to make laws for ourselves, it is well meaning and intended as they were, we failed them. Amen. That's why I knew you. I don't, I'm telling you, I know I use this when I preach my New Year's message, but I wasn't stressed. I knew it was coming. Three days in the gym, because when I go to the gym, I just want to get out and get out. Get in, get out. And I'm like, okay, here we go. You know, people are like, oh man, they're going to be here soon. All the New Year's resolution folk. But they're not going to be there long. Because you can make all the plans that you want to make and you can make all the rules on yourself that you want to. But inevitably, if you don't have the grace of the Lord strengthening you in a particular area, you're not going to be able to stick it out. I mean, the law and the gym analogy is the same. Really, it's a similar analogy that it is for the Christian life. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to do this. And it lasts for a while. But if the grace of the Lord is not moving and operating in your life, you don't have the strength to stick to it. Next verse I want to talk about is verse 4. It says, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive... Look at this, the adoption of sons. There's a lot of meaning in that term. We're going to look at it again. But here again, we see the importance of timing, right? It was always God's plan that he was going to send Jesus. But if you look at it on a worldwide stage or a salvation history time frame, it didn't happen right away. It didn't happen as soon as mankind wanted it to happen. And let me tell you why. Because God knew the perfect time to send Jesus. The time that he sent Jesus, and I talk, I've talked about this a lot too, was that people don't realize it. And I've used this one time when I was talking to a doctor that didn't believe in God. And I felt like the Lord, I like to talk about these kinds of things, like from a logical argument. We talked about Paul did that. The perfect timing that God would send Jesus. Rome had built all of these roads in order to give people easy access 
Before that, Alexander the Great had conquered the civilized world or Western civilization and it caused everyone to learn the Greek language. So they were all writing and re reading and speaking one language. And there was a road system to get people where they needed to go. And right there in the middle of all that that's happening on the world stage, God allows Jesus to show up. That's just one aspect of the fullness of time. The world was logistically ready for the gospel to go forward at that point in time. God knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> Many times in our own lives, we're wanting God to hurry up and do something. But the truth is, is that he knows logistically where he needs to get us spiritually yeah. in order for him to uh, uh, effect the most gain in the midst of our lives. Yes. Amen. Uh, sometimes we cry out, Lord, for quite some time before we actually see the victory that we want. It's not that the victory isn't secure. It's that the Lord uses time and circumstances as teaching tools in our lives. That, that, that's a whole lot to that. God uses time and circumstances to teach us things in our life. You know, the world wouldn't have known grace if it would have never known law. And we could never know freedom if we had never known bondage. And you can't really understand the concept of how the cross gives you access to grace if you've never attempted to live for God in your own strength and seen the failure Amen. that comes from that. Amen. But when you've experienced that for yourself, listen, I'm telling you right now, when you've experienced that for yourself, when you're trying some, most of the time, when you try to talk to some people on a, you know, on the surface level about the Lord, about the message of the cross, when you start to understand it for yourself, when you really start to understand it, it's almost like people can't shut your lips. That's one of the ways you know you got a revelation of it is when you can't, people can't really shut your lips because you, you feel like you got to talk to somebody about it. And when you start talking to people about it, a lot of times they act like they know what you're talking about. And the reality of it is, is that if you talk to them long enough, you, now I'm not saying this condescending. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just being real with you. As a person that's talked to a whole lot of folk, they act like they know what, what you're talking about, but in reality, you know that they don't. But let that person experience their trial of faith as they continue on in their works-based Christianity and continue to experience the failure that they do and then to get the revelation of the cross and God doing it for them. And it's a completely different story. The point that I'm trying to make is until we tried it that way, how would have we ever known the other way? God knows it's in the fullness of time, both on the worldwide stage, but also in our individual lives. Amen. But ultimately what that passage was talking about, what had to do with salvation, because he said right there that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so that word having to do with adoption of sons, ultimately, that's the whole point. Before God's people were under law and therefore like immature children, that were too young to enjoy the inheritance, right? But regarding maturity, the word adoption in that text right there, it could be read like this. Like this is how the Greek scholars describe it. Having been given the place as an adult son. So really what the idea is, is not like our form of adoption that we understand in America. Like here's this little infant baby. We don't have children. We can't have children. So we're going through the adoption process to have a child for ourselves. No, the idea here is that you've been given the status of an adult son. Now you're prepared and you're ready. Your position is ready to receive the inheritance. That's what when the time frame came, that the fullness of time came. God sent Jesus under the law. He was born of a woman, born under the law. Everyone will be judged according to the law if they're not judged according to the sacrifice of Jesus. Yeah. That's the problem that mankind doesn't understand today. That's the issue when you talk to people on the outside who think that they're okay and that they're good enough that they don't understand. They're either going to be judged based upon Jesus' sacrifice for their sin or they're going to be judged based on their performance according to the law. And each and every person is guilty according to the law. And so therefore they will stand before God naked and and they, and they will not have a case to plead. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son that we might be adopted into the faith. Amen. It describes the fact that God's plan for his people is that they would grow into maturity at conversion. Our position is as a mature heir, but the condition of our heart has to be molded further. 
We don't have to turn there, but Romans 8, 28 and 29 talks about being conformed into the image of Christ. When you get saved, you're already an adult son in Christ. You already have access to the inheritance of God. But your position is different than your condition. You're, even though God sees you as mature and all grown up because you have available to you everything that you need, you're still, we're still too young and immature at that point in time to be able to process all that, to understand where to put our faith, and there's a growing period. But Romans 8 talks about the fact that we're conformed. It means to be molded. Amen. The Holy Spirit molds us yeah. into the image of the Lord. Second thing I wanted to talk to you about is the inheritance starts now, but it doesn't end now. I don't think I'm going to get through this whole message, but we'll end with point number two. Verse six says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This, this is the beauty of conversion. This is the beauty of the fullness of time. This is the beauty of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit's not just on the outside looking to help from the outside. He's on the inside living on the inside of us. And, and the word Abba, Father in the, in the Greek or in the Aramaic has the idea of Papa behind it. It describes an intimacy and closeness. Once again, if you are close to your daddy, it's hard for you to be able to wrap your mind around that, especially for a man. For a man who you were raised, if like for me, my understanding, I still deal with it. That's probably why the Lord really never gave me a son was because he knew I'd probably mess him up. Just like my daddy was trying to mess me up. I've told you before and I know it is what it is. I honestly know that my dad loved me, but it was only because he let me blow my snot on his shirt one time. He never really told me that he loved me. He never really hugged me. You know, all I got was a whole bunch of verbal abuse. But I realize now that what he wanted was he wanted me to stand up, be a man. And in his own mindset, the way he was raised, that's how he did it. Kick him in the butt. Come on, boy, get up. You know, and and so that's how I was raised. And, and, and that was my understanding. I didn't understand Papa. I didn't understand Abba Father. I didn't understand that you could run up to your daddy and hug him and hold him. There's a, there's a certain level of, of intimacy connected to that. And most of the time, men never are able to enjoy that kind of a connection to their father because most men are, are raised in such a way to look down on that. To, whenever you show that, that type of behavior, it's almost like it looks like a sign of weakness, if that makes sense. But to understand the love of the Lord, to have that closeness and that intimacy, that close relationship. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, if you truly allow the Lord to work in your heart, your heart's going to get softer. Yes. And if you got a problem with a soft heart, then you probably ought to just shut it down. Because the Lord is going to soften your heart in some way, shape, or form. Amen? He's going to cause you to begin to realize when you're acting towards people and treating people improperly. But that's what another passage of scripture that talks about this that we use a lot is Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It talks about in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. When you first got saved. The Holy Spirit was a down payment when you experienced that. If you got saved, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that you did everything that you were supposed to do right yesterday. But what I'm saying is if you really got saved, you know that the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your heart because things have never been the same since then. But that's just the down payment of the inheritance. There's more to come. Good news is, is that the inheritance does start now, but it doesn't just end now. Amen. Because he says in verse 7 of Galatians chapter 4. It says, and if a son, then an heir of God. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7. I think it's the last part of the verse. If a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're no longer a servant, but a son. Let's look at eight, uh, Romans 8, 14, verse 17. And then we'll, we'll shut it down. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. That's the beauty, once again, of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit lives in our heart. He wants to lead and guide us. He wants to give us direction. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There it is again. The spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. That means that, listen, the inheritance starts now. You've received your down payment. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. You have access to grace to be strengthened and to walk in victory today. But guess what? There's more to the inheritance on the, on the latter end. You're going to one day, this whole earth, you understand, I know you understand this. This whole earth belongs to Jesus. He's going to rule and reign as a king on this earth. Yes. Just as he was glorified, we also will be glorified. Amen. He will rule and reign. We will rule and reign with him. We're joint heirs with him. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. One thing that I will leave you with is this. <laughs> is that we need to also balance it out and to understand that we're not going to get everything that we want on this side of the inheritance. I thought that was so liberating when Brother Larson first told me. I heard him first say that. I mean, this was probably, I don't even know how long ago. He said, you're not going to get all of your inheritance on this end. I'm not saying you can't experience great blessing. I'm not saying that some people aren't going to be blessed more than others on this side. I'm not saying that pe some people aren't going to get a whole lot more of their inheritance than what other ones will. I don't understand why some people, you know, when I, I don't get, get it all, why it happens the way that it does. But what I will tell you is this, you're not going to get everything on this side. Because there's some things that are waiting for us, amen, on the other side. But what we need to be thankful for, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, and we're closing with this scripture. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. Made us meet. What does that mean? He made us worthy. The Father made us worthy. How did he do that? Because he had a plan. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Amen. I know we've talked about this scripture before, but I doubt you remember it like I do because I try to study it you know, go over and over it in my mind, in my head. But there's two kinds of people on the earth. There's saints and there's not saints. And the saints are going to inherit. We're, we're part of the realm of light. And there's an inheritance that belongs to the saints yeah. in light. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, yeah. even the forgiveness of sin. There it is again. The sacrifice of Jesus. The redemption of the Lord. The shedding of his blood. That brings us from one place to the other. Takes us out of darkness. Brings us into light. Amen. Allows us to be joint heirs with Christ. Allows us to receive an inheritance in the light.